afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the first of Brady's webinars that are going to be exploring how gun violence prevention research can inform policies. Today we're going to be tackling the topic that is um, one of the most difficult to address, but it's also the topic that makes up the majority of gun deaths, and that is suicide. Our future webinars are going to be focusing on data-driven solutions to gun industry reform oversight, which will be on January 6th, as well as public health sector reform, which will be on January 14th. So I hope you join us for those as well, and all information will be on uh, Brady's social media page. But so let's just jump in for today. Um, I am really excited to be joined by three leading experts in the field of gun suicide prevention. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Kai Hunter. I am the inaugural Sarah Brady Fellow here at Brady. I am also a professor of military and strategic studies at the United States Air Force Academy, where I study military and veteran suicide prevention. Um, and I'm myself a Marine Corps combat veteran who has experienced a suicidal crisis. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Mike Anestis, who is the Executive Director of the New Jersey Center on Gun Violence Research and an Associate Professor of Urban and Global Public Health at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And he is a leading researcher on suicide firearm uh, prevention. Also joined by Dr. Emmy Betts, who is an ER physician and injury prevention researcher who directs the Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative at University of Colorado's School of Medicine and is the co-founder of the Colorado Firearm Safety Coalition. She also is about to go do her last ER shift before receiving the COVID vaccine. So um, excited for, for that one today in a happy public health news that we can celebrate as uh, Americans today. And finally, we are also joined by Dr. Robert uh, Kinscherf, who's a clinical and forensic psychologist and attorney who is a former chair of the American Psychological Association Gun Violence Policy Task Force. So we are so honored to have you all here today. And as you see, this is a group that has a very diverse research background in actually understanding gun suicide. And in, in knowing that as we move into a new administration, there are some direct policy actions that can be taken to address this leading cause of gun death in the country right now. So I'm gonna jump right in with our, our questions. And um, I'm going to, I think just as a, a bit of housekeeping here, I will sort of give a, an overview of a topic area and then ask pointed questions to, to each of you um, in, order to, in order to prepare. Um, and for the audience, we are not gonna be taking any audience questions today, but please put any questions you have in the Facebook comments and us as participants, can come back in and engage with you all on social media and answer your questions that way. And that's just for the, for the interest of time, but we're really looking forward to engaging with you all on social media. So let's jump right in. Um, lethal means access is a very known risk factor for actually dying from a suicide attempt. Um, it's often incorrectly assumed that someone who has one sort of means in mind that they are going to use for suicide will, just substitute another means if there's there's lack of access to to that means. Um, you know, essentially, there's this misperception that if someone has a suicidal crisis, there's no way to stop them from from dying. Um, however, we also know that the majority of people out there don't actually make plans or attempt if they experience a suicidal suicidal crisis. Um, if someone does attempt suicide at access to lethal means, I'd say particularly guns that are the most lethal means is often the difference between life and death for, for that person. Um, suicide, they, they account for a very, or firearms account for a very small number of attempts, but over half of the deaths are, are actually from them. Um, you know, if we think about suicide or firearms over 90% lethal, other methods are all less than 4% lethal combined. So just sort of setting the stage that, that way. Uh, we see this you know, play out in the numerical dis disparity quite a bit. In my own research right now I'm doing for the Air Force, they have found there's been a actual dramatic drop in suicide attempts, but still over a 25% increase in fatalities. And a large part of that now is that 
over 70% of all attempts of active duty Air Force members are being made with a gun. And so they're seeing a huge, huge increase in that actual fatality. So that discussion around the fatality of firearms when it comes to suicide is what I want to talk about first. And so Emmy, I'm going to, to kick it to you first with your work in the, in the ER and in injury preventions. When you think about firearms attempts for suicide versus other methods of, of attempts, you know, how, how is your experience with just the panoply of injuries you see in the ER and you work with every day it helps you to contextualize some of the differences around means and really the unique lethality of firearms? So um, and first off, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's been almost hard to convince my ER colleagues about the importance of talking about firearms for suicide prevention, precisely because we don't see the people who attempt with a gun because usually they die at the scene and they don't make it to the ER. Um, that's very different from um, other methods. And, and you know, I'm, I'm grateful that ERs are open 24 seven and they're to help people going through all kinds of physical and, and uh, mental tough times. Um, uh, so we see lots and lots and lots of people who are having suicidal thoughts or have made attempts. Um, and the big difference is that if someone has taken pills, even dangerous pills, often there are treatments we can give them to stabilize them um, and get them through that period. Um, you know, if someone takes uh, pills or attempts with non-firearm at home, there's a bigger chance um, that they'll be found, that they'll have time to regret it themselves and call for help. Um, and with a gun, you, you just really don't have that that second chance. Um, I'll also say, I think, you know, in, in thinking about all this, Kai, in your introduction, you mentioned this sort of um, misconception that suicide is not preventable. And um, as a loss survivor myself, which almost everyone is, um, you know, when we think about the loved ones we've lost, sometimes it's hard to imagine what else could we have done to have saved them. Um, and, and I think there is this sense often that there's nothing we can do. But in fact, we know from the numbers that the vast majority of people who even have suicidal thoughts don't act on them. And that if the method that um, they're thinking about isn't there, that, that they don't substitute another one. And so that's why we're picking on the guns. They're highly fatal um, and highly lethal. And it's um, locking them up during periods of crisis can, can really help. Yeah, I know, you know, for me, for me personally, it, it was the matter or the difference between life, life and death of having a, another Marine buddy actually intervening and, uh, taken away guns when I was in a, in a low point. And yes, there were other things around. I, you know, whether it was pills, alcohol, bridges, and none, not one of those ever, ever crossed my mind. So I think just that's such an important part. And I think that feeds well and well into, to Robert, you know, when you were at your work with the APA, you talk about gun violences in the, in the plural when we're, when we're discussing this, this large scale epidemic. Can you talk a little bit more about why this inclusive term is so important, especially when we're addressing this issue of lethal means when it comes to suicide? Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, this is an area that's uh, near and dear to my heart and I think a very important conversation to have. Um, I come from the perspective that America does not have a gun violence problem. It has several different distinguishable gun violence problems and that we're not going to be able to find one solution to all of them. In fact, it will be a quite complicated uh, set of solutions, just like it, you're, you're not gonna find one vaccine that takes care of all infectious diseases, for example, or one mechanical fix on a car that will create uh, maximum safety, they have to come in combinations. And so I like to think about breaking this down into sort of very traditional public health categories, uh, primary universal prevention and secondary, meaning people who are at higher risk than others, and then tertiary people who are identified as being at acute significant risk of so people who are currently suicidal and in this case have access to a weapon. Uh, even if we just think quickly with ourselves, we can distinguish homicide and suicide and unintended slash accidental injury and death from guns. And if we just say right in the, the suicide category, we appreciate that we're, we, having this framework allows us to have targeted communications, screening, assessment, and intervention that can be matched to specific populations with particular uh, 
plans and goals and training for, for people. So you're gonna to have to have different kinds of communication strategies and different kinds of intervention strategies to address a variety of different populations. You're not gonna be able to have a one page handout that you can give to adolescent uh, African-Americans, for example, who have recently had a 75% spike um, in suicide attempts. That one page handout is not gonna work uh, for everybody, if they're military or middle-aged men, elderly persons, veterans, Native Americans, rural people. So this framework allows us to think about who are the people that we wanna have this conversation with, be it at the prevention level, the secondary intervention to lower the risk that they're in, or actual intervention to help somebody move away from that point where uh, they are literally making a life and death decision. That's so important because so often when we talk about gun violence, it's thought of as just this one lump thing and we're not going to get the solutions that actually matter, much like the demographics of people who have access to guns aren't all the same either. And we need to understand those circumstances, which leads very well, Mike, in, in your work, can you talk a little bit about some of the differences in these populations that you see at particularly high risk um, at, at given periods of time and what some of the, the demographic breakdowns of the, the work that you've done actually looks like? Sure. And, and, you know, I don't know that the, the demographics and the work that I do differ from what everyone else does. And, and, and I think it just sort of maps on, which is to say there are certain groups who are more prone to dying by suicide using a firearm. And those groups also just tend to be groups who are more likely to have uh, gun ownership, right? It's, it's, it's an access question. So you see higher rates of firearm suicide amongst males, amongst service members, amongst folks in rural populations. Um, amongst folks who might identify as members of honor cultures, right? Places where you're just, firearms are more prevalent and the prevalence of the firearms in a lot of ways doesn't prompt suicidal thoughts, but might shape them. And in fact, the study Emmy did like about 10 years ago showed that the, the folks who have suicidal ideation, if you have a firearm, you're much more likely to have a plan about firearms as opposed to other methods. And so it's not that it prompted the thinking, it shaped it, right? And so you see those demographic patterns mapping onto the places where the firearms are. And I think, you know, building off of uh, what Dr. Kintrick was saying, um, in terms of primary versus secondary and tertiary prevention, I think that highlights the importance of primary prevention because these same demographic breakdowns also correspond with folks who tend to avoid mental health care, who don't want to tell you about their feelings or their suicidal thoughts. And so in a system that's designed to wait for someone to say, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time, I need help, they aren't raising their hand, right? And so when we talk about interventions that, that manage access to firearms, you need to think about this at a population level, not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with targeting folks who we know are at risk, but you can't do that exclusively because you're gonna, because of these demographic differences, you're gonna miss such a huge swath of the folks who are at really highly elevated risk of this outcome. That's why it's so common for us to say, I never saw this coming when we lose someone because they're in that group that wasn't in our mind their picture of what suicide looks like. Yeah, I think being able to both target while broadly engaging is is one of the tougher things. And and with with that and understanding the populations is what I want to turn to to next. Because one of the things, you know, in my own work with looking at the military community in particular, gathering data is hard on this topic. It is hard to gather because and it's intersecting a few topics that are very hard to gather data on. It's gun ownership. Is very hard to to gather gather data on to look at you know, where that risk factor actually lies. Mental health issues are very hard to to gather data on because of of privacy. And again, I think really to to Mike's point here of people being willing to self report is is difficult. How things are captured, even the types of injuries that are actually suffered are sometimes hard to get consistent data on across. A variety of, of different, whether it's even just different hospital systems that are there since there, there are differentiations. And so, you know, research often relies on, you know, focusing very specifically on a population because we can gather you know, generalizable data on that and trying to move up or fill in some of those gaps. So I'd like to, to ask all of you a little bit about, you know, what some of your techniques have been for data gathering throughout the course of your work. And then as well, 
you know, what, what advice, what recommendations do you have, whether it's for the CDC, I know they come up quite a bit, you know, and looking at this as a public health, we need, before we can actually come up with the CDC giving public health guidelines, we need the CDC to gather meaningful data. So whether it's from the CDC or if there's another federal agency you think needs to be more involved and more consistent about data gathering, would love to hear from that. And um, Robert, would like to start with you on this one. So I'm not a primary researcher in the sense that I typically am not involved in developing primary databases, but I like to take a multimodal approach from the databases that we've got because we don't have one perfect database. Uh, we do not have one really, really solid information capture that gives us the information we would want, especially not on numerous subpopulations. So I certainly uh, respect uh, the data that's gathered by the CDC. I think it's very important. I think it's also important to acknowledge that they've been flying with blinders on uh, for some years after the passage of the Dickey Amendment, which um, we can argue about it, but it had a, clearly had a chilling effect, not only at CDC, but elsewhere on gathering uh, data from people who uh, expected to be uh, funded by, by, by federal dollars. Now that's been relaxed somewhat, but CDC data, uh, law enforcement data, uh, emergency room data, uh, data from uh, medica uh, medical studies. I'm a, I'm a big fan, especially of epidemiology studies and especially when they're beginning to drill down into specific subpopulations. So I think it's very handy to know, for example, what the suicide rate in Arizona is but it's also important me for, or any other state, but I'm picking Arizona because it has several subpopulations of interest where the rates are different. So um, uh, persons of, of uh, Hispanic descent have different rates than persons of European descent who've been here for multiple generations, although many of the Hispanics have been there for even longer uh, given the history of the place, Native American populations, age stratification, all of those are very important. So. Um, I think without research, uh, we're flying blind. And as there is no perfect uh, research-based database that covers it all, uh, we have to do the best that we can to take these snapshots and essentially create a mosaic of the patterns of suicide for different regions, different demographics, and different means. And Mike, how about you? Yeah, so I certainly don't have the blueprint of perfect data collection. I would love to hear it. If someone has it, that would be great information for me. Um, but what I would say I do is I try to mix it up, right? And so my team will sometimes work on an individual level. So we'll do a clinical trial and work with folks individually and, and do a deep dive into what's going on uh, with them. Um, and, and so it's a smaller group of folks, but a much more in-depth assessment. Whereas other times we'll zoom out to more of an epidemiological lens and we get you know, much more surface level assessments, but a much larger and more representative group of folks. And what I like to do is look for convergence, right? So you know, we're always trained in multi-method, uh, multi-informant being our best approach to go, right? So you, you get as many different methods as you can, and you look for common threads across. And, and again, it's that mosaic idea uh, that was mentioned is that from there you can piece together as, as much confidence as you can in your data. But yeah, no, I don't know that I have the answer to the the, the best uh, approach there is. What I will say, Kai, to your second question about um, what needs to be done, I don't know that I have a specific agency in mind, but, but what we need is forward thinking and a willingness to um, ask difficult questions, right? So, so a, a willingness on a national level to further investigate suicide deaths or potential suicide deaths and ask questions about things like access to a variety of means and, and, and circumstances surrounding that individual's life so we can do less speculation and have more of a systematic understanding of things. Um, because again, the piecemeal individual studies, even when they converge are piecemeal individual studies, right? They're not a beautiful large database of a nationally representative group of folks. Thanks, and Emmy? Yeah, so uh, I agree with what uh, both Robert and Mike said. Um, I, I come at this, I think, um, from a perspective, especially now shaped from kind of my past um, decade or so of work of really thinking about how do we engage com the community in, in the data collection process in um, 
for me, for me, and I think that's important because it um, both informs the kind of data we are collecting and the kinds of questions and the kinds of um, measures, um, but it also makes the data collection better. Um, so for example, through um, our work in Colorado with the Colorado Firearm Safety Coalition, I've learned a lot, had a, a lot of help in, for example, writing survey questions in a way that makes sense to gun owners and is gonna help get the answers that are meaningful to me, but also hopefully meaningful to the firearm owning community in that if we all share a goal of safety, how do we actually study these things in a way that will produce meaningful results? Um, I do a lot of qualitative research now, meaning one-on-one -on -one interviews or focus groups. Um, we're doing focus groups right now with older gun owners around the country. Um, and again, I think really getting, sometimes getting down to that individual level is so critical because you've got to start um, really understanding perspectives, needs, challenges, and so forth. And then that can help build, as I mentioned, for, for surveys, like Mike and I have both done a lot of survey work. It's piecemeal, but it, it, it especially if it's anonymous, it can help you get this data, these data, because Kai, as you mentioned, it's doubly sensitive. It's about your mental health and it's about your guns. And people don't often don't want those recorded anywhere. Um, I, uh, about a, two years ago, we did a trial in the emergency department enrolling adults with active suicidal thoughts who were also gun owners. <laughs> and you can imagine it was challenging. And I think the only reason we were able to do it was because we had engaged our um, firearm owning kind of advisory board in the process of writing the consent, writing the questions, writing the script for how we approach people to make it comfortable and to, to sort of ease some of those fears. Um, and so I think when it comes to, to big data sets, um, so I will say, I love the CDC. I, I, when I was a kid, I wanted to work at the CDC. I don't, maybe I still do, but, but I think in this space, um, I actually would not jump to federal agencies collecting data. I think we're not, I think if we, if, and when we do that, it's gotta be carefully done. So for example, adding questions to existing surveys, national surveys, um, I think is one way to go. Um, I think thinking about, again, those other measures. So um, there was a report a few years ago from the RAND Corporation that included things like defensive gun use and cost of firearm ownership and, and, and measures that I think are really important within the firearm community. And I think it's important we start asking those, how often have you used a gun for self-protection and so forth. Um, and so my wish list in the near future would, is funding. I think that federal funding through the NIH, through NI National Institute of Justice, through the CDC, to support the different groups of researchers doing this kind of work can really help move things forward um, and hopefully start to help that collaboration and then um, build to kind of the larger um, data systems and can help with things like standardizing um, collection across ERs for patients seeing that, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but for me, I think the funding could be better spent um, distributed to different groups as opposed to trying to build a, a national database registry that is going to be controversial. Yeah, Thank I, you I for that. Like I, mean, oh, briefly ahead, add, I was just uh, going to briefly add, if I could, that um, Emmy's work kind of breaking this down into conversations at the individual and small group level with input from firearms um, constituencies is really, really important because it's otherwise such a polarized and polarizing conversation that we lose a lot in the fog and the smoke unless there is some uh, mid ground where people can have this conversation because I, 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 don't, I don't know where the pro-suicide lobby is, right? Um, uh, and I certainly don't know where the, the pro-accidental injury to a child lobby is. So there, there is a way in the kind of work that Emmy is doing and describing to really kind of create um, a conversation that can yield the most valuable uh, research amongst the highest risk groups, highest risk, not necessarily of suicidality, although some of them are, but simply as Mike was pointing out, the simple fact of access. And I think, you know, it's like you were reading my mind for how I wanted to take this conversation um, a little, a little forward, Robert. Um, and, you know, and, I mean, I agree, research is, is definitely one of the biggest things that funding for, for this, this is, um, though I can see a lot of people who are serving on IRBs having their like, 
head starting to explode with more research about gun owners and mental health intersection. And they're all like, ah, ah, but it's better for, for all of us to, to have it out there. Um, and this intersection of actually engaging with firearm owners much more deliberately. Because I think one of the, and, and, and Robert, you were, you were hitting on this directly, you know, if you frame it as suicide prevention, as unintentional injury prevention, even as intentional injury prevention, like homicide, I, there's not a homicide lobby out there you know, that, that I, I know of either, but so much in how the rhetoric, especially when it gets to promoting policy out there gets framed is as it's pro-gun or anti-gun, not pro-prevention of whatever the thing is. In the case that we're talking about today, suicide prevention, you know, like not in, in terms of suicide prevention. So when we're thinking about research with gun owners in particular around this, it's how, how do you think we should be as I'm gonna say now as researchers, I'm gonna have you put on two, two hats here. So as researchers approaching the questions, but more importantly than that, as researchers and, and academics who are all actively, I think all of our work actively engages with gun owners coming from a gun owner myself who works with the military population, who's all gun owners, knowing that all of you are also engaging in this work. What are tips for actually communicating this to policymakers who may not be gun owners, who don't have that experience. Because I think this is where a lot of things get lost in translation is it gets picked up and championed as a, this is gonna take away the guns. And particularly when we're talking about suicide, you know, the vast majority of completed suicides with a gun are from a legally purchased gun by somebody who does not have previous previous flag. So these are, up until really the event, these are often what we would think of as, you know, legal gun owners, in many cases, even responsible gun owners. They are, are members, I think, talking, thinking to some of where Mike and Robert had talk, been talking about, you know, there's a lot of intersecting factors of these identities, but often people who are sort of admired as being responsible in society. So how do we better both research this population, but more importantly, that communicate about the nuances and engagements that need to take place so that this doesn't get framed as a pro-gun, anti-gun solution, but really a suicide prevention solution that, you know, to Robert's point, there's not some pro-suicide lobby out there that's, that's talking to. So um, I'll really kick it open to anyone who wants to, to start off with that one. I'll jump in. I, I, so I, it's really hard. And I, I say, I will say as a physician researcher, sort of it, in this space, I um, don't do lobbying sort of very specific political work in large part because I want to be able to be seen as someone who is actually open to these conversations. The short answer is that we need to learn how to actually listen to each other and work with people who have different opinions and move away from talking points. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's what's wrong with politics in general right now. And so how do you fix that? I, I don't know. Um, but but I think continuing to, to say exactly what we're saying right now is really important. You know, I feel like even five years ago, I got a lot more grief from even people in the firearm violence prevention community saying, well, you're just promoting ownership and you're promoting gun, you know, that you, you have to have a hardline stance. And, and I think that has, the conversation has changed even in the past few years. Um, so some of it, I think, is just continuing to point this out and to point out the findings and, and to try to lay them out clearly and, and to try to help um, and hope that people can move away from just, from just the either or talking points. Because, I mean, the, the overwhelming thing that I have found is that, um, the gun owning community is is diverse in every way you could think of, except that they all want their families to be safe and they don't want to lose loved ones. And and so how do we again come back to that central focus and actually find ways to do that instead of just shouting at each other? Um, I don't know. When I figure that out, maybe I'll retire. But <laughs> but until then, I'll keep at it. So. It's this is entirely anecdotal, but I'll toss it out there to see if it resonates with uh, Mike and Emmy and with you, Kai. So uh, I live in Eastern Massachusetts now, 
um, in the urban part of eastern Massachusetts. There are more gun owners in the west, more rural western part of Massachusetts, but I grew up in West Texas and I grew up in a gun culture. Um, and one of the things that I've learned in working with uh, clinicians and you know, behavioral health clinicians and physicians and so forth is that many of them, um, I'll, try, I'll try and put this in, in a little more precisely. We talk a lot now about cultural responsivity and the need to learn about the cultural embeddedness of people's understanding of the world and how they operate in the world and so forth. And I think a step that we can take is to uh, consider gun ownership in many, not all cases, but in many cases, part of a broader culture in which people live. Um, and that there are a variety of different gun cultures, not all of which are alike. What I've discovered is if you don't know anything about gun cultures, uh, especially if you've never owned a firearm yourself, um, the tendency is to either uh, not ask about it at all because you have this kind of implicit bias that the people that you're dealing with don't have them, which we know isn't true. Um, or if they do ask, they ask in a way that um, puts people in, in a very defensive posture. Um, and so they either don't tell you what's really going on um, or they don't come back and see you again. Um, and so a place where we can begin as a professional community and even as an advocacy community is, is to understand that um, these are people who um, are, are more like us than unlike us and who do not want carnage uh, in, their, in their homes and, and loss. If we can agree that that's the common meeting ground, then let's talk about the best way to achieve those goals and work with people the way that we would work with people in any other culture where what seems apparent to us may not seem so apparent to them and vice versa. So I agree with everything you guys have said. I, to me, there are two really big parts of the solution to, to what you're asking, Kai. And the first one is, is just a willingness to engage. And so what led me to take the different position I've taken now professionally is a general frustration with scientists and to some extent healthcare professionals, but really just academic scientists like myself to be insular and talk only amongst ourselves and not engage with anybody um, and so that we fail to convey these points effectively to stakeholders, whether that's policymakers or anyone else, because we don't convey them at all. We are silent and we write esoteric journal articles that nobody ever reads except our own students, right? And so that's not effective. And the second part is humility. Um, I, I think that a willingness to understand, like you were saying, that this this is a culture, right? And just because you don't identify with it doesn't mean you get to demean it, right? Um, and I think that the the way that we present ourselves and the way that we speak about things so often makes us come across as arrogant or uh, as though we view ourselves as the expert from up on high coming in to tell people what to do. And we would never allow someone to do that to us and yet we feel entitled to do it. And so I think a willingness to speak up and to speak in a way that can be heard as respective. You know, the reality is we can talk about the data and the same data can be viewed very differently by two different people. And if we approach it in a way that makes it combative, the chances are they're gonna see those data differently than we do. And so you have to create an environment that makes people want to hear it. And I think that by doing that and leading by example, you then create an environment in which policymakers or others see this in a, in a clearer way, because what you're saying becomes accessible and what you're modeling becomes more appropriate. Yeah, I, I really like that humility aspect. I know that's something here in El Paso County, we've been really focused on as part of the El Paso County suicide prevention. It's a, the county has one of the highest instances in the country of gun suicide, just in terms of, of numbers, but we're a, I think it's a, it's a county that hits some of the highest risk demographics, both in terms of just the amount of gun ownership in the county, but also the military veteran population here, the aging population here, the rural population here, the you know getting hit by the economy, you know, bad economy, uh, basically everything that you could possibly say as an intervention lives in this microcosm that that we have. But I think really to Mike's point, 
the biggest thing that some of us who are, are researchers have done is I think approach with this humility of what do you need to help save your lives and going to folks like, you know, the county sheriffs and the county commissioners, like what do you actually need and how do you actually do that? And I think this ties very well into the next question, which is really more about engaging more directly with some of these identities. And I think one of the things that we see is a, a hesitancy, you know, as, as has been noted, either a hesitancy to talk about guns at, from practitioners, especially from medical and mental health care practitioners, you know, the sense that I'm not a gun owner myself, so I'm not going to identify you know, with it. So that's on the one hand, either disengagement, or I think to Mike's previous point, and I would say it's not only academics, but advocates suffer from some of this too, of speaking from this on high of, I have all the answers, this is what we need to do. Here's why why we need to do it. I don't care what you think because you are hit, check off every potential little box as to, you know, all of the ivory tower things that I think many of us have probably been accused of in our own own lives as well as being a being a part of. You know, but the the fact is it is complex. You know, I can speak from the military veteran perspective that for so many veterans and active duty military people, the, the gun, the firearm is an extension of self because it is with you so much. And telling someone to remove that is like telling them to take a limb off and put it in a safe for a while, just because of the consistent, you know, law enforcement sees this too. It becomes a, a safety blanket. You know, when I was flying in Iraq and Afghanistan, there is not a moment I didn't have a nine mil on me to the point that when I got back in country, I would look for it because I was just used to the weight of carrying it around. I started to walk differently when I got home because I was so used to having just the weight on it. So, so there's some of these very real things. So from your, your populations, what are some of these sort of key subsets of culture that you've uncovered, you know, that you've seen that maybe surprised you a little bit you know, that, that would be good, I think, especially for the, the non-gun owning audience to be, to be aware of, of these are some of the just deeply ingrained, because to, to Robert's point, very rarely do people buy guns sort of as a one-off thing and never think about it. It happens, it is there, but for the majority of gun owners, there's some deep-seated cultural identity piece in this. So would love to hear from you all, you know, what, what are the pieces of that identity that you've uncovered in your research that could be helpful for people who want to come together and create these comprehensive solutions to combat suicide to know about? So I'll open it up to the, to the floor as well here. Mike, you just did some great work. I'm, sure. so I'm, I'm gonna pick on you actually. I said I would open it up, but I'm picking on you because I know about the work you just finished. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the work we just finished, Project Safeguard is a randomized controlled trial of legal means counseling for firearm owning members of the Mississippi National Guard. So I, you know, I'm neither, I'm not from the deep south. I don't own a firearm. I'm not military affiliated, right? So this is an opportunity to work with folks who differ from me in a lot of very meaningful ways. And I think we went into this project anticipating um, a lot more conflict um, than we did. And, and it actually went great. It, literally every single person who got the intervention said they'd recommend it to appear. Um, we got a lot of positive movement in terms of safe storage behavior. Um, you know, I, I'm hesitant to say we found this subgroup or that subgroup, right? We haven't, you know, the, the scientist in me says, I haven't run a profile analysis, right? So I've, I'm speaking on anecdotes, right? And so I guess what I say, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but what we generally found were you know, differences between older and younger firearm owners in terms of what it meant to have them, differences amongst folks who did or did not have children in the home. But the most pronounced thing that I've noticed both in that work in Mississippi, but but also beyond that in some of the larger, more sort of epidemiological work is, is you've got this group of folks who are owning firearms for personal protection, at least one, typically a handgun in case someone breaks into their home in the middle of the night. And that folks are, are marked by anxiety and not anxiety in general, not that you, someone you characterize as an anxious person or a nervous person in general, but a very specific general sense of not being particularly fond of uncertainty and not being necessarily particularly trustworthy that other folks are going to behave appropriately and handle the problem 
And so there's a, a drive to solve the problem yourself and that there's this tool that offers that sense of safety for themselves and their loved ones. And so we saw a lot of that um, coming from both the Mississippi work where we're speaking to folks one-on-one -on -one in a much more sort of intimate conversation about their firearms and why they store them the way they do. But also when you zoom out and you ask a self-report questionnaire, I think that's the group that sort of stands out to me quite a bit. And I don't know if you'd call that a culture, because like I said, it, you see it in Mississippi, you see it everywhere else, you see it across age groups. I think it's more of just a, a, a particular um, characterization or character group of, of firearm owners who are need attention, need us to better understand their perspective and how we can best reach them. Well, I, Mike, I think that that point tracks uh, the enormous spike in um, firearm sales that we see after uh, sort of difficult political moments um, or when there is unrest or when COVID hit and people were not sure that, you know, well, it's the toilet paper we can't find today, but what if it, tomorrow it's everything? And, and what happens then, a sort of sense of anxiety about uh, civil disorder and there are regional differences in how much people trust uh, the civil society in which they are embedded. Um, and uh, that's, just, that's just a reality. The, the other thing that I had come across, which I hadn't really thought about, um, because before I moved to New England, I thought of New England as a, a, a relatively prosperous part of the country, and it is. But I was not aware of the extent of uh, really quite extreme rural poverty in large parts of New England where when people tell you the reason that they have a gun is because if they don't have a gun, they're not gonna feed their family all year long uh, reliably. It's not a rationalization, it is, it is a real thing. And then we can talk about the difference between a, a, a long arm you know, uh, or a, a handgun and, and what that means and so forth. But um, I, th I think your, your observation that people are responding to a world in which they, they find themselves and are making what from that point of view is a rational decision. Um, and one way in which we can help them perhaps is to have conversations with them about uh, assuming for the moment that that's a rational decision, I'm not gonna fight with you about the decision. Um, how do we make sure that the weapon you have purchased is actually used for its intended purpose? So sort of like back this up to what, what are you trying to achieve and how do we avoid that not going horribly awry? I, I actually love that, sorry, sorry. <laughs> like I, I think that's such an important part of this conversation that's missing because I had somebody ask me once, you know, when will you think that gun violence has been solved? And it just sort of off the top of my head flew off, you know, when no gun is used for anything other than its intended purpose. So if that intended purpose is hunting, sport shooting, that's all it's, you know, that's what it's used for. If it is home defense, even that there's nothing else, you know, like, and if it never has to be used, you know, great, even better. But I think framing it in that conversation of intended, intended rational purposes is so such an important part of this conversation. Um, Emmy, sorry to yeah, cut you. no, that's okay. I, I I totally agree, and I think that 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 sometimes is is a place where we as like clinicians can run afoul if you kind of don't um, aren't thinking of it in that sense. And so, um, you know, when I've approached this as a physician and and in trying to train colleagues, I think one of the again challenges is this this piece of if it's not a culture you're a part of, kind of not quite knowing how to bring it up or not wanting to offend people and not knowing what to say, et cetera, et cetera, and. Um, as Mike alluded to before, sort of having the humility to, to say, um, I don't understand your life, I want to help you, but I, you know, I need you to kind of tell me what will work. And um, that's what led us to um, create Lock to Live, which is a, a, an online tool to help individuals at risk of suicide find the approach that is right for them in terms of how to reduce access to firearms and sort of for clinicians to make it easier and to say, look, the end goal is that when this person is going through a rough patch, they should not have access to firearms, even their own, because as Kai said, it's not the intended purpose. Um, but there are a whole lot of ways to get there. And you as the clinician, it is not your job to tell someone how to do it unless they ask you, but it is your job to help them find the thing that will work for their family. Um, and I think sort of back to Kai, your original question, what, you know, something that may come as a surprise to some people. This perhaps is the most basic thing, but 
um, but I think many people don't quite, quite get it. If um, if a, many people in this country own a handgun primarily for self-protection, for protection of their house, their property, their family, um, therefore telling them that they need to always store the gun unloaded and locked up with the ammunition locked separately um, is a non-starter because that is that makes the tool unusable for the purpose for which they bought it. Now, you might agree or disagree about whether they need a gun in their house, but as a clinician, if your goal is to prevent injuries or as a public health professional, if your goal is to prevent injuries, then you've got to understand their perspective on why they have it and how they store it and what solutions will work for them. And that's what can move you into a conversation of, okay, what about lock boxes that you can operate with a pin and you can still get into quickly? Or what about these other solutions? And actually find something that might prevent injuries instead of um, just turning off the, the conversation. And the last thing I will say, and then I will I will stop, but I, I recently have felt really grateful and fortunate to have some conversations with um, individuals from various kind of subpopulations of, of, of gun owners or different gun cultures, um, in particular black gun owners, LGBTQ communities and so forth. And I think um, it's just important to recognize they have different, sometimes different perspectives, different views on say law enforcement and so forth. And that when we are talking again about this diverse community, the messaging and the approaches are gonna be different and that's okay. And that's the way it should be. It makes it harder, but it's critically important, I think, that we recognize those other voices out there. And and that's so important. I think that feeds into the the last question I want to ask you all in the ten or so minutes that that we've got left. When we think about this, you know, we we've spent the better part of the past hour looking at you know how research informs the fact that this is a diverse population. It but fire, you know, the, the continual thread really is that that access to firearms at a moment of crisis increases the likelihood that there's going to be a fatality coming out of it, just to sort of bumper sticker stuff. So thinking about, you know, how, how diverse this population really is, what the common thread is, do we need diverse messaging? What, what would you suggest that can be done at either a federal, state, or, or local level to actually meaningfully address this issue. You know, we've seen the, the increase of extreme risk protective orders or gun violence restraining orders in some ways, but those are also, you know, I think to, to Emmy's point, non-starters for some communities that just don't trust law enforcement for a variety of, of different reasons. Um, they also aren't universal, they, they depend on law enforcement training. So there's some real good in them. And I think we should continue to, to promote the good in them, but what else? Like, so, so in addition to, I would say not really instead of in, in addition to what, what should be done at the federal state or local level? I'll jump in on that one. So I, I, I think, I often think about this along the lines of what, what did we do, for example, for drunk driving and preventing crashes from that? Um, so at the big level, I think we need the equivalent of the Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk campaign. We need broader efforts at education, sort of cultural change, sort of understanding that in my view, and I think in the view of many people, that being a responsible gun owner also means looking out for the well-being of your friends and family, understanding what to do if someone's suicidal, let me hang on to your gun for a while, that, that kind of thing. So we need the sort of educational um, uh, kind of public facing campaigns. Um, but I think Kai, you just mentioned extreme risk orders. And to me, those are the equivalent of like, if your friend is drunk at a bar and you call the cops to take away his driver's license, like that may be the appropriate thing if you've tried everything else and nothing will help and he's gonna kill people. Um, but I don't think it's what most of us would do in you know the first time you would have a designated driver, right? You would help get the person home, get them through that period. And so that's where I think there's really some, um, some place for, for positive action, specifically on um, making it easier for people to step in when a friend is at risk, meaning holding on to someone's guns temporarily. Um, it gets really complicated because of background checks and so forth. And without diving into that, I'll just say, I think we need to make it legal and simple for people to do the right thing when they're worried about someone. Um, and that includes then things like 
liability coverage for firearm retailers or ranges who offer temporary storage, who are worried about, well, I'm not a psychiatrist. How do I know if I can give the guns back? How do we help them do the right thing in offering temporary storage? Um, so so that, the, that's sort of my, my wish list, along with the, the funding for research, certainly. I would have two things that jump out for me, and one of them maps on a lot to what Emmy was saying in terms of the messaging. Um, and, and again, I always go to the, the drunk driving parallel as well. And, and the thing I'd add to that is that when you think about what they did there, it was friends don't let friends drive drunk and equivalents. It wasn't just that drinking and driving is bad. It's here's what you should do. And so that in order to shift social norms about storing firearms or helping people reconsider their storage practices, we actually have to engage that audience to encourage them to do that. And you have to saturate the message persuasively and frequently enough that people adopt that behavior. It's the same way I tell folks, I don't remember when I started sneezing into my elbow. I just know that I did at some point, right? Um, we need that same thing where it's just suddenly people are like, well, of course that's what I do, but it wasn't what they did before. Um, so you need to effectively message to shift that social norm as one. The other that I think is a little bit outside the box, but you know, as a psychologist, I often think less about punishing the thing I don't want and more about incentivizing the thing I do, right? So if somebody owns a firearm for self-protection, well, they want to protect themselves. I could say, just don't do that. Okay, it's unlikely to yield sustained results. What if we instead incentivize other ways to keep your home safe? So this would be a heavy investment in it and, and incentivizing of home alarm systems, of, of dog adoption, of baseball bats. I don't care, right? But all sorts of other things that people have, heavy duty locks on their doors. I don't know, but something else that provides that same sense of I am keeping my family and myself safe in my home that is mine to protect without having to take that away. Because like you said, what we're often asking um, in these interventions that I myself champion is to do this thing that's fundamentally incompatible with your value system as it relates to this tool. So those would be my two things. So um, I, I think that we can establish broad policy, but we have a sufficiently diverse country and patchwork of gun cultures that there's not going to be any one solution that is going to have the intended consequence um, uh, across the board. So we know that um, with the red flag laws, uh, there is some research that suggests that in the uh, jurisdictions which have adopted them and have also enforced them, which is two different things, you, you can get measurable results or the um, child prevention uh, gun access laws have a measurable impact, but not every jurisdiction, not every state is going to want to do those. And what we know is if you ask people to uh, abide by statutes that they fundamentally don't think will work or work against their interests, either they just stop doing it uh, or the people who are responsible for enforcing it locally just stop enforcing it. So I, what I would think would be um, useful in addition to the kind of the gun equivalent of friends don't uh, let friends drive drunk is some sort of um, communication initiative at the state level, uh, perhaps backed by some federal incentivizing dollars where the federal government doesn't tell you what to do, but says, here are some resources to do something and then the expectation would be for, that the state would come up with some measurable outcome interventions that would be acceptable. And in order to get those, since we know that states can have very, very different regions, that at least on the large municipality or maybe even the county level, the state has to devise this with the, uh, the communications, with, with the, the constituencies that they're actually gonna have to, to deal with. I, there are some places where a child access law would make people's head explode. There are other places where people would say, that's common sense. Why do we need to have a law? And the answer is because some people aren't even really thinking about it. And it's at least one way, a way of making it visible. For our own profession, this would have to be state by state probably. Um, it, is, it is remarkable to me that people can get through long periods of post-baccalaureate training into professions and nobody has ever given them this kind of information um, taught them how to do lethality assessment, both homicide or suicide. And the number of tropes that I still run across 
uh, that are sort of inherited wisdom, but really are not of much practical value is, no, I, he was safe to go home. He contracted with me for safety. And, 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 and that, is, that, is a, that is still incredibly common. So in terms of what we are requiring of accredited uh, training programs in uh, medical schools, in clinical psychology, uh, licensed social work and the like, uh, this is a place where we can simply set uh, a basic bar about what we're gonna ask people to know before we cut them loose in the community in order to practice independently. Um, and that's sort of a, a matter of, do we have sufficient guild will uh, to overcome the uh, inertia of our own, you know, training histories. Yeah, I think that that point about communication and especially some particular field, you know, subfields of the communication, we were launching the end family fire suicide communication. One of the things we found is that even among, you know, social workers, psychologists, medical professionals, we you know, we interviewed and worked with, there was always this pause of thought when you when you brought up the idea of lethality and guns and suicide, there was almost this like, oh, well, oh, I guess, yeah, you're right. That isn't it, you know, like it, it wasn't this natural. And if it's, if the professionals, you know, among the, the population, it's a huge, you know, just the lack of understanding about the issue. And then even among the, the professional side, I, I think Robert, that really hits your point of how much training is required to make something natural you know, just for it to be the natural response as part of your lethality tracks and part of your thought process is so much that that's such an important, important aspect of this. Um, but with that, we are just about out of time here. I, I want to thank you all so much for, for joining me for this incredibly fruitful discussion. I think as we can see from this, there's research that is is really important to inform what we where we put funding priorities and where you know where we put policy priorities but also so much more work that needs to be done on this on this topic to actually dig in and understand what the life-saving solutions will be um i i encourage you all as well who are looking for more information on this topic to visit nfamilyfire.org because there is a lot of suicide um, prevention information there as well as information about safe gun storage that that is there um, to to look at and talk about um, for more information as well on our upcoming webinars please check the Brady social media sites as well as check the Brady social media sites for links to the social and professional bios of the great panelists that we have on today so you can follow along with their work and um, continue to use it to get the uh, you know get some some data driven life saving saving solutions out there thank you all so much for joining us today have a wonderful day a wonderful holiday season and i look forward to seeing you all in 2021 thank you so much thank you